thank you for this uh, wonderful initiative to organize this uh, meeting celebrating uh, Giorgio. Oh. So uh, th this is a uh, Giorgio lecturing, and I started. I wanted to start with this picture. You 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 will see that he is. Uh, actually lecturing about uh, something that is easily recognize, recognized by people who are experts on spin glasses. That's clearly the moment of ultrametricity. And, uh, and I, I wanted to uh, uh, reco recollect a little bit some, uh, some of that time. Uh, I actually myself started to, to work on statistical physics um, around 1981 when 1981, 1982, in, I had started a PhD uh, on, the, on the standard model and parity violation and that's its application in condensed matter physics. And I decided to move to, to statistical physics. And I was very fortunate that at that time there was a visitor at Ecole Normale who was Miguel Virazoro and who told me, well, I also would like to spend my sabbatical working on statistical physics. So we started to work together and study papers. And one day came uh, Gérard Toulouse, and he told us, look, um, I know you're working on these things. And there is one, one point that I want to mention to you. In spin glasses, there has been this paper by Giorgio Parisi that nobody understands. And uh, you should have a look at that. And that was uh, the, the famous series of papers, actually, that uh, Giorgio wrote about uh, replica symmetry breaking uh, solution of the, of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And so with Miguel, we started to, to work on that. In the meantime, there was a beautiful paper by Giorgio 1982, in which he was showing that with this solution, his functional order parameters was inter could be interpreted as, as a, a function, which is a probability of overlaps between pure states. So there started to emerge this, this picture of uh, the spin glass landscape in which you have many uh, minima of the free energy actually and many low-lying minima and the probability distribution of the overlap which means the distance basically of these of these various low-lying minima is the order parameter which is hidden which is encoded in in Paris's uh, uh, function that appears in uh, with the replica symmetry break so with, with Giorgio, with, with Miguel, we started to work on that and very soon we made connection with Giorgio. And the first step was really to understand better what was encoded in these very mysterious uh, uh, end going to zero limit of the, of the replica approach. And uh, we understood that what was, uh, what was encoded was this, was this landscape and that this landscape has very, had very special properties. And in particular, the, the set of distances between pure states is uh, what is called an ultrametric, which means that it is as, as if you have a branching process with which you build the set of pure states. It means that if you look at three states, uh, they build a, 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 a triangle which is either equilateral or isosceles. And uh, that is what was uh, written on the, on the blackboard of Giorgio that I shown just, uh, just before. The other thing that we, that we soon realized was that this function, this order parameter function, actually fluctuates from a sample to sample. It fluctuates because the weights of the states uh, sam uh, fluctuate also. If you look at one state here, it has a, a probability of weight, which is e to the minus beta it's times free energy normalized. But these free energies, they are actually very fine tuned, they differ by some small differences which are of, of order one. The, the free energy itself is of order n, but the small differences of order one, they monitor the values of the weights of each state and, and they are very fragile. So if you go from one sample to the next, you will have uh, fluctuations of the free energies and fluctuation of the weights. And, uh, and the usual order parameter is the average, the expectation value of a disorder of all uh, samples of this P of Q. So we, we, we understood this fluctuation and we also found out that uh, the, the, the effective free energies of the states, they are actually independent random variables with exponential distribution. 
So this, uh, this started a whole, uh, a whole uh, trend uh, to, to understand better such kind of, uh, of distributions. The second thing that we did uh, was uh, um, started, to, started to think about an alternative to the replica approach. We, we, uh, I mean, the replica, it was clear that replica symmetry breaking was extremely uh, rich. It encoded a lot of hidden information. But uh, at some point, uh, we, we thought that there should be an alternative, and, and we developed this, uh, this uh, so-called cavity method, which uh, basically starts from the same hypothesis as the replicas and gets the same conclusion. But it does not take the path of zero by zero matrices, but it goes through a standard a standard path of, of probabilities. So uh, that was uh, interesting because it was also it started, uh, let's say, a direction which took uh, a few decades, actually, but which was the way to uh, to prove uh, rigorously uh, mathematically the validity of the replica symmetry breaking. As, as soon as, as uh, the whole program was started, very soon after a couple of years, it, it appeared that uh, there could be some applications of, of all these whole formalisms uh, much beyond spin glasses. That spin glasses was a kind of starting point, very important. But in some sense, uh, the fact of building a, a mean field theory of spin glasses it is generically the, the challenge that was posed by that problem was the challenge of setting a mean field equation for a system in which every single spin sees a different environment. It, it interacts with other spins in its own way. It has its own coupling constants. And so uh, when, when you start to realize that that is what you need, then immediately you see that with respect to the standard mean field, in standard mean field, you have one spin, it is representative of the whole sample. And you look at an effective equation on a single spin because the environment is doing the same thing. In spin glass, each spin has a completely different environment. So you get coupled equations and they will come back to that, coupled equations between local spins and, uh, and, and local magnetizations. And as soon as you are able to, to handle that and to monitor this equation and maybe solve them and put them on the computer, then you can address many other problems. And very early on, it was understood that you could look at some uh, very important optimization problem, like the traveling salesman problem, for instance, or, or neural networks. Of course, there were at that time, there were very influential papers that came out. There was a paper by Kirkpatrick, Gelat, and Vecchi about simulated annealing. And there was uh, the paper by Hopfield uh, about uh, uh, modeling uh, uh, activities of neurons with uh, basically what is a, basically a spin glass model. So uh, this is why in, in our book, which appeared in 1987, we already had that beyond. That is, it was clear to us that one thing which was very important was this uh, uh, reaching out toward uh, away from the the spin glass themselves, but going to the other fields. And, uh, and uh, later on, uh, Phil Anderson actually uh, coined the, the sentence in a series of articles that he wrote on, on spin glasses in physics today. He had one which was called the spin glass cornucopia. And I will not try to list to you, for you the, the various aspects of the cornucopia. You would find applications of the whole thing, both uh, going from uh, finance to biomolecules, to systems biology, to information theory, to optimization, etc. That would be a long list. I have chosen to take one example, which is the example of, of inference. And so I will first uh, um, define a little bit inference. Inference is a word that is used in, in various branches of science. It certainly starts from statistics. So in statistics, uh, inference uh, means uh, trying to infer a hidden rule or maybe hidden parameters from data. So in a restricted sense, what you would like to find is parameters of a probability distribution. So if you open a book, uh, for instance, in the first page, you will find typically this kind of, of question. You have an urn with 10,000 balls. You draw 100. You find that 70 are white balls and 30 are black balls. What is your best guess for the composition of the urn? How reliable is this guess? What is the probability that the, that the urn is, is 6,000 white and 4,000 black? 
And immediately you would sit down and, and say, I will assume that there are only black and white balls. I will assume that there is a fraction X of Y of white. Then the probability to pick up 70 white balls among 100 would be this expression here. And uh, I, I can uh, look at the value of X where it is maximal. And I will find that obviously the maximum is at 0.7, a fraction 70% of weight boards. That's kind of obvious, but you get something extra. You get that for instance, the probability that it would be 0.6 is given by this, by this quantity. So this is just a very simple example to mention what is inference in the standard way in statistics. And here I was using actually without mentioning it, but I was using Bayesian inference. That is, I had, uh, uh, I was using basically the posterior, which is if I know, if I assume that I know the fraction X of white ball in the urn, what is the probability of my, of my data? My data is how many white balls I have had by drawing 100. And uh, there was a prior, which was what is the prior probability of having a fraction X of white balls in the urn before I do any measurement. And this I had taken uniform. I had not mentioned it, but it's the natural choice that everybody would do. Of course, that's the big, the big step of, of a Bayesian inference. You need some prior information or assume some prior information and you, and you have then the data the probability of the data given the parameters. And from that, you, you, did, you find what is the probability of the parameter here, the composition of the urn, given the data, which is what, how many balls you have drawn over each color. Inference appears in, in various settings. And in, in recent years, there has been a lot of inference uh, doing with, dealing with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. In machine learning, basically what you want to have is, uh, is a machine, which is an algorithm, which, uh, which will be uh, able, for instance, to read uh, handwritten digit, identify handwritten digit. And, and uh, the idea of machine learning is that you will have a complicated algorithm with many parameters, and you would like to infer the parameters from data. And what will be the data? The data will be examples. So you will have a database of handwritten digits, for each of them, you know what is the digit that the person wanted to wanted to draw. So that was that was a, a, a guy wanted to to write a, a zero. That was a five. That was another zero. Or eight, etc. You know this result, and so you can have a supervised learning in which you will uh, you, you will have this database with the desired output for each image. And in machine learning, what you do is that uh, you build a neural network in which you have as input, you have this image. So in this case, it is uh, uh, 784 pixels, let's say black and white to simplify. And from this string of 784 numbers, which is uh, white, 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 and when you get here, black, 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 etc. From that, you want to find uh, the output is a five. And uh, the neurons are doing something very simple. They are doing a, a weighted sum of the signals from the input neurons. And the parameters are the weights. What is uh, this neuron here? It receives a signal from, from that one. This signal is modulated by the synaptic efficacy. And this is synaptic efficacy is a parameter. So here you have already hundreds of parameters in these very simple neural networks. In practice, in modern machines, you will have hundreds of millions of parameters that you want to fix. And you have to look at very large database, of course. Finally, a last example that I want to mention of inference, because it is one also in which uh, the statistical physics idea have had some, some importance, is information theory and particularly communication. As soon as, soon as you transfer information, you, you will uh, need to have some error correcting uh, process. Uh, this is what I do here when I talk to you. Uh, I talk to you in English. In English is a redundant language. Uh, it is a language which is such that if I don't pronounce very well one sentence, uh, you know, I say sentence, uh, you recognize it, I wanted to say sentence. But uh, if, if, if the English was not redundant, 
you would have an uncertainty about what I wanted to say. So I use redundancy. And the idea of error correcting code is precisely in general to use redundancy. You have an initial message, you code it by adding some more extra bits, extra bits which will implement the redundancy. You send it through a channel and, uh, and, uh, and once you receive the message, you need to decode in order to reconstruct what was really uh, uh, the initial message. A very simple example is a repetition code in which you want to send this image, you send it three times. The channel here is a, a noisy channel. It flips, a, it flips a pixel with probability around 0.1. And you see that um, you have three blurred images. And here you will look at each image and for each pixel, you say this top one was black here, it, I don't remember what it is here, it is black and here it is white. So I take the majority rule and I say this pixel is, is black. Pixel by pixel, I take the majority rule of the three images that I have received. And you see that I am lowering the level of noise. Okay, that's a very simple example of, of code uh, and of decoding, but uh, there have been uh, built uh, some much more sophisticated codes in particular, the ones which are actually used, which are based on a parity check, low density parity check, which are very closely related to screen glasses. We will not have time to elaborate on that, but that's a whole field in itself. So what is statistical inference? Statistical inference is uh, uh, when you want, you have a challenge, which is you want to find a rule which has many hidden parameters. As I was telling you before, in, a, in a deep learning, I have millions, I have tens of millions of parameters that I want to find. So my unknown is a n-dimensional vector where n is large dimension. Then of course, I will need many measurements and I will have a number of measurements which is equal to m and I will have a crucial parameters in all the, in all the inference problem, which is m divided by n. What is the amount of data with respect to the amount of unknowns. And, uh, and we will ask several types of questions. One type of questions is uh, questions of algorithm. I mean, given the data, do you have an efficient algorithm that is able to give you the most probable value of the hidden parameters, for instance? And you will have questions also about what is your prediction on the quality of inference? Is your algorithm the best possible one? Is it far from it? Uh, how reliable is it? Uh, and this will be more a kind of theoretical approach. And in practice, this second step here, predicting the quality of inference, it will typically lead us to finding phase diagrams. That is, we will see that when you vary this parameter, the amount of data per variable, per unknown, uh, typically, inference will be easy when you have a lot of data. When alpha becomes large, it will be easy. When alpha is too small, it is totally impossible. And there is typically, and we will see that, there is an intermediate range in which inference is in principle feasible, but algorithms that are able to do it are extremely hard to find. And this is uh, the glassy regime. So uh, I will uh, explain you a little bit that on some example. Let me uh, finish the completing setting the stage for statistical inference. So you have a problem where you have n unknown parameters uh, with a certain prior on the parameters. You have a certain number of measurements, m measurements, and you have uh, the probability of the measurement when you know the parameters. And you do Bayesian inference, that is you want, given the data, why is the data? Uh, given the data, you want to reconstruct the parameters. And so you use Bayes law. Often, and I will keep to this case here, you have independent measurements. That is each time you do a measurement, you have an independent information, an independent data, a sample from the same parameter, from the same distribution. And uh, we will also uh, um, place ourselves in a, in a basis in which the prior on the variables, on the, on the parameters is, uh, is factorized. So if you take this setup, you find that the posterior really is, is written as a product of 
some distribution over each variable xi. And then a, a, a factor that comes from the measurement, which I can write as exponential minus some of all the measurements of a certain energy, which depends on the parameters, my unknown variables, and on the experimental measurement. So this is typically a, a, a measure, a probability measure, which is one of spin glasses. My xi are the basic variables, they are the spins, and they interact, and they interact by this interaction, where there is one interaction for each measurement that I do, I get a new interaction term. And this interaction term, they depend on the set of variables, of course, and on the explicit data, on the explicit measurement that I have. So for those of you who are familiar with the SK model, let's say you could imagine that Xi is a binary variable, okay? And that would be uh, 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 the easing spins. And then this interaction in the standard SK, it would be pairwise interaction, that it, it would be some indication of uh, 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 what is the probability for the, uh, for the pair S, X, I, X, J. And the Y mu would be the equivalent of the, of the coupling constant in the SK model. It's a quench variable. It is given by the, by the experiment, by the measurement. So once you are there, you are in business, you can do some statistical mechanics. It is actually useful to write what is called a, a factor graph representation of this problem. You have the set of variables, they are the blue circles, which are here. For each of them, there is a, a basic measure, which is pi not of xi, that's the prior, could be binary spin or it could be more complicated. And then for each measurement, for each data point, you have a, 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 an interaction term, which may connect several variables, pair variables, etc. It all depends on the problem. Here I am, I am really setting up a very general, uh, uh, a very general frame. Let's say um, you could have uh, discrete or continuous variables. The interaction should could be short range or long range. But you have fundamentally, and that is something which is very important. All of these problems of Bayesian inference, and, and you see they appear in very many branches of science, they are, from the point of view of statistical physics, they are quenched random systems. And the disorder is this measurement, is the measurement Y mu. That is, for each set of, of measurements, you have a new problem. Let me give you one example, which I, I think is uh, maybe it helps to understand. Imagine that I have a problem in which uh, uh, I have a problem of a material science in which I have a binary mixture, a binary alloy. And there are two components in this, uh, in this alloy, the black and the white. And I have a sample and uh, I want to understand what is the composition, what is the real distribution of the black and the white in the sample. So this would be a, what I show here on the screen is a slice of my sample. And I would like to identify slice by slice what is this sample. So that's typically a, a, a problem of tomography. Very important for many applications in material science, but also in medical applications, as you know. So the, the, for materials, what you would typically do is take your sample, go to the nearest uh, uh, synchrotron, uh, send synchrotron light to that, and, and look at what, uh, with a camera, you look at what is the intensity that has been transmitted. And if you assume that the two uh, components of the mixture, the black and the white, they do not absorb the light with the same coefficient, then of course you have for each pixel of your camera in which you measure here, you have an indication, which is what is the proportion of white and black along this ray. So that's one measurement. So here I have a measurement. It tells me what is the proportion here. I have a second measurement, et cetera, et cetera. So if I have my camera as a width of L pixels, again, I am doing the drawing in, in one slice. So I have L, pixel, L pixels in this slice here. So for each angle, I will have L measurement. And what pe people typically do is to take, to take the sample and rotate it L times and you do L times a measurement. So you do L times L measurements, you have L square measurements. And with that, you can reconstruct L square pictures. So you will, you will be able to get the, the real composition of this, of this uh, material at a resolution of 
L square pixels uh, with measuring L angles, in which at each angle you do L parallel measurements. That's the standard way. It is done by what is called the Radon transform. Yeah, that, that you can invert. It's a bit like the like uh, the, the Fourier transform. It's a linear transformation. Now imagine that your sample here has a domain size xi which is much larger than the pixel size. Then there should be a way to uh, get the composition of your sample with doing a number of measurements which is smaller than L angles. Because the information content of this image, in order to describe to you this image, I don't need to give you L square number. I could be much smarter. I could give you, for instance, where are the boundaries? And, and if the correlation length of this image is much larger than one, then of course I will, I will give you much less numbers. So it means that this image can be compressed. If it can be compressed, maybe one can speed up the measurement and one can reconstruct it with much less measurement. And that is what is done. Uh, uh, for instance, this image, when it is digitalized on a thousand by thousand grid, so in principle, it could be reconstructed by looking at 1,000 angles. But in practice, we have a way to reconstruct this image by looking at only 16 angles, which means that we are speeding up the reconstruction process by a factor 60, uh, which, is, which is quite a sizable uh, factor. And in particular for uh, medical applications, this is compressed sensing and it's, uh, it's something very important. How does one do that? I will not give you the detail, but I want to give you the, the, the idea. So what is a measure? So of, first of all, what are the variables? The variables are easing spins. On each, uh, on each vertex, there is an easing spin. It tells me if uh, the alloy at this point is the black or the white, okay? Then a measurement corresponds to a ray here. On each ray, I look at the sum of all the spins in this ray. And I know this number. I have measured it. Probably it will be measured with noise. But imagine that I have taken away the noise just for the sake of the, of the presentation. Of course, then one wants to do the, the noisy case. You have then, so this is a measurement. And from these measurements, you want to reconstruct the spins. So a priori, of course, you need as many measurements as there are spins. That's the standard model, the standard uh, theory. Uh, what I say is that here we have something more. We have a prior knowledge on SI because we know that we have an alloy. And if we have an alloy, it means that this, if this is a black material, rather probably the, the neighbors of this guy are also black. So you can put a prior, and the prior will be one which tells you that neighboring pixels here, neighboring values of the spins are more likely to be equal. And the prior which describes that is one which is well known. It is just an easing prior. You put a weight on each, edge of this graph, e to the j s i s j. And the value of j, you monitor it by, uh, uh, by in such a way that the correlation length of this easing model will be more or less the one of your sample. So then your inference problem is the following. You have this prior, which is the easing weight. And for each measurement, for each ray that you measure, you have a constraint on the sum of the spins for this ray. This is a, an easing measure. It is a complicated one, but you can study it with the belief propagation approximation that I will mention uh, in the following. And this is how it is, uh, this is how it has been done and how we can speed up uh, this, uh, this measurement. So the point is the following. With this measure here, if you have enough measurements, which means enough constraints of this type, then there will be one configuration of the spins which will be much more probable than all the other ones. And this configuration of the spins, it is the one from which you took the YMU. It is a real composition of the system. So uh, the whole point is to understand that actually there will be a phase transition. That is when the, you, you will need a fraction of the number of measurements per spin to be beyond a certain threshold. And if this is the case, then you will have a much more uh, probable configuration. The ground state of your, of your spin distribution will be the one 
corresponding to the real sample, the one from which you generated the data. That's what we call the crystalline state, not crystalline in the sense that this is not a crystal at all, but it is crystalline in the sense that it is a configuration of spins, which is much more probable than all the other ones. It's not easy. It's not easy because in general, even if you have a configuration of spins, which, which is more probable, it's not always easy to find. Finding a crystal is not always trivial numerically. So this is what I call uh, crystal hunting. And, uh, and basically what, what has been developed uh, has been uh, 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 trying to find this best optimal configuration of the, of the hidden variables, the one that you are looking for, uh, using sophisticated mean field-based algorithms. And uh, of course, mean field equations have a very long uh, history. Uh, in, in glassy systems, uh, certainly a big step was done by Thaules, Anderson, and Palmer for the famous TAP equation of 1977. And uh, uh, later on, we had uh, uh, equations that came from the, from the cavity method with, uh, with Giorgio and Miguel. And with, and with Giorgio, we managed to find these equations for systems where the connectivity is finite, where each variable interacts with only a finite number of other variables. In all these works, basically, uh, of, the, of the physicists, uh, there was not so much the idea of an algorithm. These equations were a tool for the theorists to, for instance, to understand the phase diagram. So we developed ways to analyze statistically the mean field equations. And that is, that is the essence of the, of, the, of the cavity method. That is, we, we write these, these mean field equations. It's a set of n coupled equations between the local magnetization. And we find a statistical way to understand the distribution of magnetization, turn it into a distribution of overlaps, and find the solution of the, of the, of the problem. Uh, in, uh, other fields, for instance, in error correcting fields, uh, Gallagher in 1963 introduced the idea of a, a, a parity check uh, error correcting codes. And there, of course, the decoding problem is the crucial one. So the, the question for them, it's an engineering question. You need, he was not so much interested in the phase diagram, did not have a notion of the phase diagram, but he was interested in the algorithm. And so uh, they started to develop uh, the algorithm in inference. Perl also did this independently in 1986. And then at some point, there was a junction of the, of the whole ideas coming from physics and coming from other fields. Let me give you the basics of, of, uh, of the BP uh, algorithm, which is very simple. It's just a mean field equation. It is. Um, I like BP because it corresponds to beta piles, and one can argue that the first ones in, in physics who really uh, wrote some type of equation uh, like that was, were beta and piles. They were doing it on a homogeneous system, so we were very far from algorithmic problems, but still the equations were there. And in other fields, it has been called belief propagation, which is a vocabulary that I will use. So imagine that you have a problem with a certain number of variables. This is a factor graph. Here you have five variables, and they have a certain number of factors, which are the square. And each factor corresponds to an interaction term. So A is an interaction between the spins one, two, and four. So it could, it's a three-body interaction. In fact, for physicists, they should write it E to the minus beta, a certain energy, which depends on X1, X2, and X4. And that's it. And this graph tells me what spins interact with what other spins. What, are, what is the structure? What is the structure of the space of, of interactions? And uh, the idea of the BP equations is the following. You, it's, an, it's a cavity idea, basically. You will, at least that's the way that I understand it. Uh, you will uh, look at uh, the variable x1, and you will ask yourself, well, if there would not be this interaction term A, if A would be x absent, what would be the probability of x1 in the absence of a? And this, I call it a message, which is sent from 1 to a of x1. And this message, you could understand it as myself, the variable x1, if you, the constraint, the energy term a, if you were absent, 
That would be my marginal distribution. My probability would be M1 to A of X1. The second type of message would be, again, I look at variable one. I erase all its interaction terms. I keep only one. Here I have kept C. And I, I ask, what would be the probability of X1 if it is connected only to C? OK, so that could be a message sent from C to one saying, from my point of view of the constraint C, from the rest of the graph, et cetera, I, I think that your probability should be MC to one of X1. And then you write coupled equations for these probabilities for these. So for instance, the probability of uh, one in the absence of C is the probability of one due to D, due to E, due to F, you take the product of all that. The probability of the variable X2, when it is connected only to C, well, this you need to do something, a small computation. You need to sum over the values of X1, the values of X3. You have the weight, the interaction of X1, X2, X3. And you have the probability of X1 in the absence of C and the probability of X3 in the absence of C. So these are closed set of equations. If you look at it, uh, I go a bit fast, but they are really easy. It's easy to convince oneself. And so you have closed equations that, uh, that are uh, being forwarded in both directions on each edge of the, of the factor graph. And they are updated by very elementary local probabilistic rules. When is it exact? When, if you look at it a bit more carefully, I was very fast in, in deriving them to you, uh, you will realize that I was actually uh, cheating a little bit in the derivation. And in general, this is not, these equations are not in general correct. So for instance, when I tell you the second equation, I tell the distribution of X2 in the presence of C, it depends on the distribution of X1 in the absence of C, the distribution of X3 in the absence of C, and the factor. But this is, here I have done an assumption. I have assumed that if I erase the factor C, X1 and X3 are not correlated because I have taken a factorized distribution. M, probability of one in the absence of C times probability of three in the absence of C. In principle, it should be a joint distribution. So from this, you can really very easily prove that the equations, they are exact on a tree graph. If the graph is a tree, I erase C, then one and three are no longer connected, and then the equations are correct. If the graph is not a tree, then it depends. The equations a priori are not correct. You can still try to use them as an approximation, like you would use a mean field approximation. And it turns out that they become exact if you have locally tree-like graphs, with very, because in a locally tree-like graph of the Erdersteini type, you will have very long loops. So the loop here will be of, of order log n, diverging in the large size limit. And so the correlations decay at large distance and you can neglect them and it becomes exact again. There is a special case of infinite range model in which the messages that I was uh, showing here, they can be turned on messages on the site instead of messaging of the, on the edge. And that leads to the famous uh, TAP equations that have received uh, other name in, uh, in uh, information theory, like uh, AMP, uh, GAMP, et cetera, equations. What happens in a glass phase? Well, in a glass phase, uh, the situation is, is complicated. Uh, the, the, the thing that happens is that this uh, famous factorization of the message, the one that is related to um, the absence of correlations, it becomes exact if the graph is locally tree-like on the one hand, but also you need to restrict the measure within one pure state because you need that the correlations decay at large distance, that the condition for, for being able to apply this factorization. So it means that actually, if I take the free energy landscape and I restrict to one pure state, then within one pure state, my, my BP equations are exact. But, but of course, I have several pure states and actually we know that there are an exponential number of them. And so it means that there will be exponentially large number of solutions to the BP equations. So this is very complicated. And actually what you see is that in such cases, 
if you just iterate the BP equations, you don't find, you don't converge because there are too many solutions and the, and the algorithm is wandering without finding any of them. And uh, the, the, in such a case, what we uh, found in uh, more or less 20 years ago with, uh, with Giorgio Parisi and, and Ricardo Zecchina was that there was another way, which was to look at the statistics of the message. So on each edge of the factor graph, there is a message. But this message it also depends on the pure states in which you are. Now, imagine that I look at the statistics of the message with respect to the set of pure states. Then I have a meta message, which is a probability of the initial message. And this, uh, this, you can write the equations for this meta message. It looks complicated, but it can be turned into an algorithm, which is a very practical one, and which is actually uh, still now the best algorithm for solving a random satisfiability problem. So it's a real concrete example of how, of how the understanding of the landscape, understanding of the existence of pure states can be turned into a very uh, sophisticated uh, algorithm. So uh, these uh, sophisticated mean field messages, they are, uh, they are very efficient. Uh, they are also fast. Uh, it's not always easy to know when they will uh, solve the problem, when they will converge or not. We know that they are exact on trees, but that are simple problems. But uh, they are, at least uh, in some cases, you can prove that they are exact. In other cases, they are heuristic. They are always very useful to look at. Uh, it's also interesting that they use local, simple update equations where each message is uh, updated using information from incoming messages. So it's a distributed way to solve global hard optimization problems. I will give you uh, one example of that. It's a, an example in which uh, the unknowns are n real variables, and we measure basically linear combinations of them. So we have a so measure some linear combination exactly as we were doing in the tomography. And there can be a, a noisy measurement. So the noisy measurement means that if the real linear combination is z mu, I actually measure y mu. And y mu is determined probabilistically with respect to z mu, for instance, with Gaussian noise, this distribution would be just a Gaussian a center. It means that the probability of the measurement is a, is a Gaussian centered on z mu. I assume that I have, a, 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 as usual, uh, I am in the right basis where the, uh, the prior is factorized over xi. And then the bias law tells me that this is uh, the, the statistical physics problem that I want to solve. Uh, examples of that are tomography enters exactly in this field, linear regression enters also in this field, perception learning and compressed sensing. I will, I will go, uh, I will not look at all the examples. I will tell you about, uh, about uh, compressed sensing. And uh, compressed sensing is, is really a, a, an interesting uh, evolution uh, um, topic in the last decade in information theory. In which, in which you want to acquire uh, an image, for instance, directly in a compressed way. You, we know that this image here, uh, if I analyze it in the wavelet, in the basis of wavelets, it has a lot of wavelets which are close to zero, because wavelets basically look at uh, you know the sum and difference of neighboring pixels. That would be the basic transformation. So if you have a gray area like here, the neighboring pixels they are more or less the same. The, the difference is, is nearly zero. This is just at the heart of the idea of, of compression, that if you reconstruct that image by putting strictly to zero the ones which are in this band here, then you need much less uh, coefficients actually to reconstruct. So the idea of, the, of, the, of compressed sensing is that uh, you do a certain number of measurements on this image. They are noisy measurements. And from this measurement, what you would like to do is to reconstruct the xi. So for instance, if you have noiseless case, that is eta mu is, not, uh, is, is zero, then it's basically a linear problem. You have linear measurements, y, you know your measurement tool, f, and you want to reconstruct x. So you, you would say uh, in, invert the matrix. But unfortunately, the thing that you want to do is to do this inversion in the case where the number of measurement 
is smaller than the number of variables. So you don't have enough information. And this is where you need the prior. And the prior is the information that you know that a certain fraction of the coefficients are zero. So your prior will be to say, with a certain probability one minus rho, my parameter xi is zero, and that these are the, the very small wavelets. And with parameter with probability rho, I draw it from some prior distribution phi of xi, which typically we take as, as Gaussian. So once you have understood this, then you can just turn the crank of the spin glass. You write the, you write the partition function, you write the factor graph, you write the mean field equations, the BP equation, and you write, in the end, you write equations which are equivalent to the TAP equations for this problem. They can be iterated, they turn into an algorithm, this is AMP, and they can be studied statistically like we do in, in the cavity method, and then you get the phase diagram. Many works have been done on that. In the case in which the, the matrix here is a, a IID entry matrix, then uh, you can look at the thermodynamic limit. You have n variables. Imagine that you have a fraction row of variables, which is non-zero, and the number of equations is alpha times n. Then the phase diagram that you obtain is the following. So this is rho. This is a density of non-zero values of the signal. This is alpha, which is a number of measurements. So if the number of measurements is above one, that's a trivial problem. When alpha is large, above one, you have more measurements than unknown. So then there is no inference. You just invert the, the matrix of measurements. It's very easy. Now, if you, if you uh, go to alpha smaller than one, of course, is, is alpha is smaller than rho, then you don't have enough measurements to infer what is the, the, the non-zero variable. You need to have at least one measurement per non-zero variable. So the hard part is this triangle here. And what we have found is that with our BP algorithm, there is a phase transition line here. If alpha is above this line, we are able to reconstruct perfectly the signal, perfectly in the noiseless limit. And here between, we are not able. We are not able in the sense that we know that there should be a solution. We know that the ground state of our statistical physics problem is the, is the image that we are seeking, but we don't have the algorithm. So it's a hard phase. And here for our reference, this was the, the usual tool that was used by uh, uh, people in information theory, which is uh, minimizing the L1 norm. So we have this phase diagram. Uh, this is here the number of spins divided by number of, our, of, of measurements, so one over alpha. When uh, alpha is small, I have not enough measurement. One over alpha is large. It's impossible to reconstruct. Here, I have many measurements. It's trivial. And in between, we know that we have the right measure. We know that the ground state of this measure is the thing that we need, but we are not able to, to find the right algorithm. And the idea really is that uh, the landscape in this hard phase is the uh, following. We have a hidden crystal, which is a hidden image that we want to find. But there is a band of glassy states, very numerous in large dimensional space, and they trap all the local algorithms, basically. It's a dynamical phase transition. Getting around the glass trap is something that can be done. If you design the measurement matrix F so that one nucleates the, uh, uh, the, na the, 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 the native state, uh, then one can improve uh, the, um, the measurement. Let me, oh, yeah, that was, no, that was uh, sorry for the, that was just the idea of, of nucleation of a crystal. In order to do that, you design the measurement matrix by grouping the variables together in bands, in groups. And in the first group, you do a lot of measurements. You do as many measurements as there are variables. So you are sure that you will decode the variables in the first group. And then you have a, a one-dimensional coupling of the groups of variable. And what you expect is that the decoding, BP decoding, the iteration of the algorithm, will first decode the first variables, and then this information will propagate, and you will have a, the equivalent of exactly a wave of crystallization, and you will be able to decode completely. And that is what is seen. That is the mean square error 
depending on the block index. And very soon after a few iterations, you get zero error for the first block. And then you see that after uh, time t equal 100 here, I have decoded exactly the first nine blocks. And I am still have to wait for decoding the other one. My, my wave is propagating, my wave of crystallization. So by doing that, we can reach an algorithm which has really been coined by this idea of there is a crystal state, there is a band of glass state, and they want to nucleate the crystal. One can really get uh, all the way to, to alpha C equal rho, which is the, the ultimate uh, goal that we had, that is decode all the way to the theoretical threshold. And we have the algorithm for doing that. So this is, uh, I, will, I will end with that. I wanted to give you a glimpse of one, one among many aspects of this spring glass cornucopia. I think uh, we, have, we have been uh, extremely lucky to, be, to have uh, Giorgio initiating this, this whole thing with his, uh, with his uh, replica solution and very lucky to be also uh, witnesses and in some case uh, actors of this uh, uh, interaction with many other disciplines in which these ideas of disordered systems have had, uh, I think, some uh, interesting uh, impact. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mark, for this really fascinating talk. Uh, so, uh, are there uh, questions? Uh, so, if you are, if there are any questions, please unmute your, uh, uh, just raise your hands, and we can take them. Uh, so, Mark, I had uh, one very uh, short question. I mean, uh, so you s uh, seem to say that the uh, ground state is always the image that we want. This is just by construction, is that? I mean. So can you repeat the uh, ground state uh, is always is the, is the final image that we uh, we are looking for that is yes. by construction is that right yes or? this is this is a, the special case of inference in inference there is an underlying system from which one has made the measurements and that is the one that one wants to infer so it exists so from the point of view of statistical physics it means that there is a special configuration it's a configuration which, by definition, is compatible with all the measurements. You have, you have drawn the measurements from that hidden uh, configuration, but you don't know which one it is, and you want to, and you want to find it. So that is, that is what I call the crystal. It is hidden. It's a hidden crystal. You want to, you want to yeah. understand it. Right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think Chandan has a question. Hi, Mark. Wonderful talk. <laughs> So I, uh, in this, this business of trying to find the crystal, you introduced this idea of seeding the crystal that, you know, experimentally people find that that helps. But people also sometimes find that annealing helps in finding the crystal. So does that uh, work in this problem that uh, is there any annealing schedule that you can use to like, you know, simulated annealing or something like that, that to find the, the crystal line of the lowest energy state? Um, it might be, but um, we have not found such a scheme, really. Uh, it's not so easy in, if you, you know, annealing would be interesting if you look at the problem, if you want to solve the problem numerically, not with mean field equations, but with, uh, precisely yeah, with, 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 simulated, with simulated annealing, let's say, mm -hmm. then that would be something uh, relatively rather natural. But in our case, simulated annealing is, is much too slow for the kind of problem that we want to handle. We want to handle a large size problem, and typically there are constraints in which you want to, to solve the problem without uh, waiting for weeks or months on a supercomputer. Mm -hmm. So that is why the mean field equation, they are interesting in the sense that uh, when they converge, they converge in linear time. The time grows only linearly with the size of the system. They are, they are very fast. But from your, your question is interesting. It's uh, when you think of it in terms of, uh, of uh, mean field equations on the magnetization, you mm -hmm. see that if you start from a high temperature phase, well, in the SK model, you will have, it's not clear that you, you will need some bifurcation of the solution, you know, at sure. some point. You could start from something in which all the magnetization are zero yeah, as yes. a fixed point, and then you need to, you need to bifurcate them. And it's not so clear that, uh, that annealing at the level of the equation of the mean field equation will help. 
but um, okay, I, I've not seen any anything like that. But maybe people have tried, but I don't think. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so there's a question by from Jaya. Uh, maybe you can just unmute yourself and ask. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Mark, for this uh, talk. So here, when you are discussing this uh, compressed sensing, so you consider these linear measurements. In machine learning right now, there is this uh, algorithm or this method called auto encoder, which seems to be uh, performing this comp compressed sensing. But it's a kind of a nonlinear version of uh, what you have over here. The, so does this ideas from spin glasses, do you think uh, th those are applicable or can we extend uh, spin glasses in that direction to include this nonlinear kind of problem? Yes, it can. Um, it has been done in some restricted case. I think uh, the limitation is not so much the nonlinearity. We know how to handle the nonlinearity. Um, uh, the limitation is that uh, uh, fundamentally when you go to... so. Let me say, I think one, one category of, system, of problem that, is, that you can address uh, relatively easily, or at least uh, straightforwardly using the spin glass formalism is the, is the case of learning in which you have either a perceptron that is only one layer of, of weight or two layers in which you have a committee machine. Then we know how to do that. When you have many layers, it becomes more complicated because uh, Basically, you have a, with respect to compressed sensing, it would be a case in which you have to not only infer the parameters, the values of X, but also infer the, the measurement, the, the value of what I was calling F mu I in my equation. So you have this, this double problem that you want to solve. It's a problem which is called dictionary learning. It's a, it's a very important problem. And I think this is really uh, the, the, the challenge. Uh, the, the, that one has to solve in order to be able to to really uh, brought to bear all these all these uh, uh, methods for the for the for the general deep learning pro problem. Uh, Sh Shumilan, you can ask and uh, just unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, so I had actually two questions. So one is that are there effects beyond mean field uh, which are important in this kind of inference problem and second is uh, I mean this kind of method is also like uh, in quantum problems uh, people have you have people used like for example localization problem in large graphs or things like that yes yes uh, certainly um, there is a whole uh, aspect uh, trying to apply it to both to quantum problems and also to dynamical problems, which are kind of the same in some sense. That is, you can have also uh, trying to infer dynamical processes. For instance, we have been using that for, uh, for, um, for the COVID, for the epidemiology case, in which you want to find a time trajectory. of. Uh, you don't want to find just the state, but you want to find this, the evolution in time. So the quantum problem will be of the same nature. That is, you will have the same thing, but instead of by basic variables x i, they will be trajectories in imaginary time, and and the, the the whole thing can be constructed. Of course, the problem then is to 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 be able to write a, a, an algorithm that that is efficient. And are there effects beyond mean field in this kind of inference problem? Like, uh, I mean, uh, are there I mean is there any problem where there are effects beyond? No, are there any effects um, beyond mean field uh, in this kind of inference yeah. problem? Beyond mean field, uh, yes, probably there, there will be. Um, at the moment, uh, well, it depends. When you do uh, compressed sensing, you basically you you use the um, you can use uh, your measurement in such a way that mean field will be okay. But uh, for instance, when you look at uh, deep learning for images the two-dimensional nature of the signal should matter. And that's something that has not been handled so, so well so far. So I think there is something beyond mean field, yes. Uh, Srikant. Yes. Srikant, unmute, please. Yeah, no, I was having some difficulty. Uh, hi, Mark. Thanks very much for yet another crystal clear talk. 
Um, I, I had two sort of basic doubts. One is, you know, when you when you have this sort of inference problem based on the number of measurements, um, if you have a, a lot more data points than the, the variables you have, um, what one normally has is, is sort of a best fit or a least squares uh, estimate of the variables um, that, that you, you're trying to infer. What sort of the, the sort of spin glass translation of that? Uh, I, I, is it... Well, least square is, is one aspect of what we are doing here. For instance, if I take this linear measurement and I take, uh, I assume Gaussian noise, the solution of our equation will be just least square. In some sense, the thing that happens for linear measurement, the thing that happens here is that we have an extra, an extra prior that is, and that is necessary because if you have many, many variables, many parameters, least square becomes, you know, something completely, you have no idea of what it will give you because you have too many unknowns. You are fitting too many parameters. I mean, here I'm talking of fitting 1 million parameters. So, you know, as with four parameters, we can fit an elephant. So with 1 million, we can fit anything. So that's why the idea of implementing a, a prior on the variable, for instance, saying that it is sparse, that I, I, a priori, I include a lot of possible parameters to fit my data, but I will require that a large fraction of them will actually be zero. So it means that the fitting algorithm will, will select the relevant parameters and it will put all the other ones to zero. So that is how, how we go beyond the standard uh, uh, least square. Okay. So, um, so the other quick question is, you know, this, this last part that you talked about uh, using the idea of, of nucleating the stable phase. Um, I mean, in the physical context, of course, um, you, you, you need some notion of proximity in order for, it, for that mechanism to work. So I assume that there are cases where, you know, where you have sort of a fully connected situation where it will not work, right? Uh, can you say a little bit more? Absolutely, absolutely. There are many cases like that. Here we... we... And I should, I should stress that here in the case that I was showing, we assume that we were able to build a measurement apparatus, my matrix F, which does the measurement, you know, each measurement is the sum of F mu i x i. We assume that I have an apparatus that I can design at will. But in practice, it's not like that. I mean, if you do tomography or if you do something like that. So for instance, we have not been able to turn our idea of seeding the crystal. We know that it works if we are God, if we are, if you have no experimentalist constraint, that is, we are the theorist. And I say, look, build an apparatus that does this matrix F that I give to you, then it will work. But if then you ask the guy, uh, if, if, the, if, the, if the colleague comes to you and say, but I cannot do this apparatus, then of course we have other, other constraints. So we have not turned it into a, a practical thing from that point of view. Uh, Srikanth, you're muted. Srikanth, you're muted. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Roberto? Oh, hello, Mark. Very, very nice talk. I, I like it a lot. And uh, I wonder, concerning what you told us, at the, the, the recent development, I wonder if there have been any um, suggestions or improvements in understanding uh, by using these tools uh, more about uh, brain dynamics. Yes, there has been, but um, yes, it's a, it's a totally, it's another part of the cornucopia. I mean, there, there has been quite a lot, there have been groups doing that. And actually there are interesting connections at the moment uh, between people who are doing that for the brain study and for the deep learning. And I think it's very interesting also for us, for, for the physicists, because what we what we start to see is what one important ingredient, which has not been studied so much in physics so far, is the structure of data. That is, if you want to have a good machine, uh, if you want to, to understand why the deep learning is, is working, 
it works because the data is highly structured. And so in, in our case, translated into our language, it means that the, the quench disorder is highly structured. You don't have IID measurements. I mean, you have, you have something, you have an image, you have something which is, and, uh, um, and this has been, this is a, there are two parallel trends at the moment. One in uh, neuro, uh, theoretical uh, neuroscience, which is looking at uh, precisely the structure of data and the structure of patterns of activation of neurons and the other ones in deep, uh, in deep learning. And I think that there will be more convergence. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, any other so, questions? Eric, I'm sorry. Want, I'm sorry. Did you want to ask a question? No, I, I just wanted, uh, Abhishek, I, I absolutely need to leave. I'm sorry, because they have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. okay. slightly. So thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, so I, I guess you have, a, uh, I'm in, step, in spite of your busy schedule, uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, so Thank you. Thank you a lot again for organizing all yeah. that. Bye. Bye. Bye.